Hey, what's going on? It's At The Letters, presented by Miller Lite, the original light beer, art and swelling, Ben Nicholson-Smith. Today is Wednesday, June the 30th, and our producers are Christian Ryan and Mike Tassoni. If you want to get in touch with us, you can do so uh, at At The Letters at sportsnet.ca. Always happy to hear from you. Ben, the Blue Jays have won eight of nine as we sit here today. Uh, what does that mean? That means they are still six and a half back in the American League East, but they do have the second highest run differential in the AL East. Uh, still looking up at the, uh, the Tampa Bay Rays and the Boston Red Sox, but uh, the Blue Jays have certainly improved their their position over the uh, the last week and a half. So I quickly pull up the old playoff odds here. 48.4% playoff odds on fan graphs, baby. Uh, hey, that's pretty easy. Why don't they just do that all the time? It's a very good stretch, right? And I think if you were to ask, if you had asked a Blue Jays fan, you know, 10 days ago, what's the best case scenario look like for this team in the course of the next week and a half, they probably would have said, you know, win almost every single game and trade for relief help. And both those things have happened since then. So, you know, it's not every day that you have those stretches where things just seemingly go right. And within that, of course, there's one painful blown bullpen loss. I mean, it wouldn't be a week without one in, in the world of the Toronto Blue Jays. But really, this has been an incredibly good stretch for this team. They're doing what they should against lesser competition. They're winning lots of games. That's the bottom line. That's what counts. And as you look ahead with the additions of Simber and Dickerson, they're in a slightly, not hugely, but slightly better place with their roster as well. Yeah, so let's talk about that trade because that's the big topic uh, this week. So the Blue Jays finally made a trade for weeks. We've been saying this club like needs to make an addition to the bullpen. They need to help out this team right now. They have done so, as you mentioned, Adam Simber and Corey Dickerson uh, and Cash coming in for the Miami Marlins. Joe Panic and uh, Andrew McInvale going uh, the other way. So uh, here's how I see this trade, Ben. Uh, the Blue Jays have traded uh in joe panic a uh a dependable and versatile veteran infielder um a selfless team first world series champion who's done everything the organization's asked along with andrew mckinvale a piece of their future ben a uh late round draft steal who's having a breakout season strikeouts are through the roof could have been an important part of their bullpen in the future. And oh, by the way, the most important thing of all, uh, payroll space, that precious and finite payroll room, all going out the door. Coming back, you have a 31-year-old reliever who doesn't strike anybody out, throws one of MLB's slowest fastballs with a trick delivery, and an outfielder in his 30s who's been a below-league average hitter for multiple seasons now and is in a walking boot, and it's completely unclear when he's going to be able to play again. So tell me what's not to like. <laughs> well, that's one interpretation. And it's an interpretation that would fit very well with uh, some of the people I hear from in my Twitter mentions. Not all. <laughs> You're not course. hearing that. You're <laughs> not. Nobody's ever said those words uh, I just said. You're not hearing that. You'd be surprised. You'd be surprised. No. There are. And <laughs> look, to be, to be very fair, because I'm sure that lots of people on, uh, who listen to this podcast also follow me and Arden on Twitter. I know oh. most of you are very reasonable. I truly believe that. And um, oh. so I don't mean to... Is it to... the Joe Panic thing? Are people <laughs> upset that Joe Panic's gone? Uh, is that it? No. Is, he, is there a bit of like Ryan Goins-ness to it there? No. The, the part that truly um, you do here is just being unimpressed with Simber and Dickerson. Really? Yes. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. You make this trade all the time. 100% you Jays. do. 100%. Like, how do you, when, when you're the Blue Jays and you look at this trade and it's on the table, like, I don't, I, I can't think of, and the way they do it, like, assess these things is they say, hey, we've got this, like, deal with the Marlins that we could make. Let's look at the pros. Let's look at the cons. Let's look at the reasons to do it, the reasons not to do it. There are so many more reasons to do yeah. it than not to do it. Like, I can't imagine how you would formulate the argument for not making this trade is it like an overwhelming you know slam dunk like uh turn you know increase your win potential by like crazy amounts kind of deal no but it's like sure it's marginal and incremental but you're better you have upgraded you've made the team better and you have given up very little it is so easy to pull the trigger on this deal i think it's it's an easy one for the blue jays to make. agreed i think it's a clear win just to be clear as to where I land on this, I think it's a clear win. And no, it's not a huge win. It's not a 
uh, a kind of deal that captures the attention of the baseball industry, nor should it, but it's still pushing the team in the direction that they need to go. And Simber is the first and most significant part of that because he's the guy who's available to help now. So he's someone who slots into the bullpen. Like you said, Summeriner doesn't throw hard, but he does limit contact really well. He's not going to allow a lot of lasers around the ballpark. It's going to be soft contact and ground ball. So that's great uh, because ground balls rarely become doubles, rarely become triples, and never become home runs. So you like you like the ground balls. And also in certain situations, you need a ground ball. So you know, you've got runners on the corners. You've got bases loaded. Great spot for a ground ball pitcher like Simber to come in. So I think he'll step into leverage right away. It might be leverage in the fifth inning. It might be leverage in the sixth inning. But there are going to be spots for Simber to pitch in leverage. And that's great. That's an upgrade. And one that the Jays needed. They still need to add on that front. But that's a help. And then Dickerson, I mean, he he kind of gets overlooked in this a little bit. And to me, he's actually someone who can help. I mean, we've, we've mentioned him before on ATL as kind of a potential... Uh, bat the Blue Jays could pursue and the reason for that is when you have a right-handed pitcher on the mound Dickerson's career OPS is 850 that's good like it's not easy to find 850 OPS guys there are a lot of right-handed pitchers out there so again not a perfect player can't expect much on defense from a guy who's now in a walking boot but he can hit and that's something you need yeah no he, he raises your floor yeah you know when you think about if you're Charlie Montoyo and, uh, you know, assuming that the Dickinson's able to get healthy and, and come back to this club, he's looking for a, a lefty bat to pinch hit late in the game in, in August or September. It's no longer, well, here comes Reese McGuire to pinch hit right. or here comes Joe Panic to pinch hit against a righty. It's here's Corey Dickerson, yeah. who is actually a threat for an extra base hit. Um, yeah, you're not going to start Corey Dickerson against lefties. You don't have to because all your other outfielders are, are right-handed, but he is like a great pinch hit um, option against a righty late in the game. And that's something that the Blue Jays didn't have. And yeah, you're right about Simber. Like he's not here to be a closer. I don't even think he's really here to, you know, pitch the eighth inning. I mean, you might get some of those opportunities right now with a lot of guys, you know, Merriweather, Delise, Baraki, all being, all being out. But I think he is here to like get you out of a jam with runners on yeah. when you really need a ground ball, you know, like that if for as soft as he throws and as few um, swing and misses as he generates, uh, his stuff is incredibly difficult to square up. And I think it's just because like hitters don't see guys pitching like him very often. Like they aren't accustomed to that. If you're seeing Adam Simber like three times in a game, maybe you could figure it out, but you don't, you see it so seldom. So it is just kind of like, it's just tricky for hitters when it's coming from that low release point, like his knuckles are scraping along the mound. It looks like the ball is rising as it comes to the plate, which obviously it isn't because that's just not how gravity works. But I think that's why he gets a lot of swings over his pitches. The sinker goes one way in towards righties. Uh, the slider goes the other way away from righties and the sinker generates a ground ball like three fourths of the time it's put in play. So uh, it, it's just a very uncomfortable look. And I think that it's, you know, a very useful tool for Charlie Montoyo to deploy in very specific situations. I don't know if I'm going to get crazy with using him against a bunch of lefties. No. I know he's been better this year against lefties, but over the course of his career hasn't been a great matchup, but if he's, Deployed against righties, keeping his pitches down in the zone. If the defense is sound behind him, great. This is something the Blue Jays need, and now they have it. Yeah, exactly. I mean, you don't want him facing lefties, but they don't have to use him in that capacity. And, I mean, I think that this is – it's all about roles and matchups and finding specific situations. Of course, the biggest and best deadline deals are the ones where you find a superstar and, you know, you just slot them in. Okay, great. You've added, you know, whatever it is, Justin Verlander to the Astros. This isn't that, obviously. This is a marginal trade. It helps the Blue Jays in very specific spots. And the cost is low. I mean, you mentioned it off the top, Arden. But, you know, you've got a marginal prospect, Joe Panic, who has essentially been replaced by Santiago Espinal, who's playing better and, and handling that role quite well for the Blue Jays. And, and so you take on a million bucks to get it done. That's fine. That's not going to prevent the Blue Jays from doing more stuff on the prospect front on the cash front they've got tons of flexibility they can be in on anyone and everyone moving forward and it helps i mean it's it's a, a deal that i think yeah makes all the sense in the world as a small uh, but helpful move in the right direction yeah joe panic was superfluous at this point yeah 
with Espinal, um, with even like Biggio slotting in a little bit in that in that role. Um, you think about Otto Lopez and Kevin Smith in the minors who could easily come up and fill that role. I just don't think that the, you know yeah. he, he, Joe Pank was a surplus at this point. So if you can turn him into something, and also yeah, like Andrew McInvale, essentially a non prospect, uh, and then what a million dollars yeah. in payroll room. Like I don't like it's kind of like it's actually kind of crazy to me that the Marlins made this deal. Like somebody needs to explain to me the Marlins rationale maybe you can do that for me like why they are and I understand like you you save a million dollars and for a franchise like them that's more meaningful than it is for the Toronto Blue Jays but I, I don't really understand why they made this deal now just for that savings my guess would be that they surveyed the market for Dickerson found that there essentially wasn't one and understood that between now and July 31st, that was unlikely to change given his health status. And so when the Jays showed a little bit of interest and a willingness to take on even $1 million, they said, all right, we can turn this sunk cost into a million dollars of savings. We're going to do it. So that's my guess from their standpoint. But it's interesting on the Jays because, you know, going into the season, this isn't a deal that I would have predicted that they would make because they had Rowdy Tellez in that role. And if you kind of view Dickerson, who has in the past been a good outfielder, depending on the metrics and the season that you look at, he has improved a lot defensively from when he came into the league. But now with the foot status, you probably are basically viewing him as a DH. So who else is a left-handed hitting DH with some power? I mean, that's Rowdy Telez. And if Telez was having a better year, there wouldn't be a need for this. But the reality is he's just not. So this also gives us a little hint as to how the Blue Jays view Rowdy Telez. Yeah, that's fair. Totally. Um, and, and the other thing with Simber before we get off of him is like three years of club control, right. <laughs> which, um, you know, I, I doubt that he's going to be a Blue Jay for through those three years. Like it's the most like, uh, you know, the most probable thing to happen would be a, a DFA in there at some point or a non-tender in there at some point. But still, I mean, like that gives you flexibility as the Blue Jays. Like that just sweetens the pot for the Blue Jays. It's impossible to look at this as a bad deal for the Blue Jays. You mentioned Rowdy Tellez. I mean, this just pushes him further out of this roster picture. I mean, it was already tough for him to fit his way in with George Springer healthy, with Vladimir Guerrero Jr. healthy, because it's like, all right, with Vladdy, he's either playing first base or DH. Say he plays first base most of the time, you still need that DH spot for like one of your four, you know, capable outfielders right now. And also you want to cycle Vlad in there and, you know, Bo's had DH days and and who knows who else you want to kind of get through there. So it was like, how are you going to fit Rowdy Tellez on this club? Well, now with Dickerson, I, there's no way to fit Rowdy Tellez on this club. So, I mean, you know, Rowdy Tellez is going to have to, like, hit and hit and hit his way into the conversation. Because, look, like, in September, it's not like it's 40-man rosters anymore. It's 28 in September now. So it's not, like, a guarantee that he'll be back up in September, that he'll be one of those two extras. So it really does put the pressure on him to perform big time in the minors. Um, so, you know, yeah, you, you got to kind of wonder about Rowdy Tellez's future even with with the with the franchise honestly and about what they might do with them this offseason just because you can't fit him onto the roster right now and he is like the, the type of guy who like deserves opportunities and deserves some time to kind of figure it out because don't forget what he did in 2020 right and it looked real the adjustments looked real and he was clearly in a good groove at the plate and he was having some success with the things that he was doing that's still in there like he's still relatively young um and like nobody's upset that the blue jays kept kevin teoscar hernandez opportunities right like that worked out well for everybody so you never know like when that breakout or when that realization is going to come for a player the blue jays just are in a position right now where they're trying to win and they don't have those opportunities to give like rowdy tellos would be a much better fit on a less competitive yeah. club with you know fewer kind of everyday mlb options at the position that he plays in the roster spot that he that he fills and it's just uh, the Blue Jays aren't there and the Blue Jays need to win and they need to be rostering players who are going to hit and perform and produce and help them win games. They don't really have that opportunity anymore to give, you know, chances to the Teoscar Hernandez's and the Derek Fishers and the Billy McKinney's of this world to try to figure it out. hundred percent. And it's, you, you mentioned a couple guys that I was just going to, I was, I was going to mention myself here along with the Socrates Britos, right? The, yeah, the yeah. Billy McKinney's like, there's so many guys that you have to churn through Daniel Vogelback to get to the one Teoscar Hernandez. And the Jays have done that over the course of the last few years. Great. They get Teoscar. That's worth all the waiver claims and all the, you know, 0 for 28s that Brito put Blue Jays fans through because in the end you end up with an all-star. So now 
at this point for the Jays, it doesn't make as much sense. If you're the Pirates or if you're a team that's scuffling the Orioles, Rowdy Tellez is a guy that I would want to see getting everyday at bats. <clears throat> so if you're the Blue Jays, that could figure into trade talks at some point. Rowdy Tellez, you know, it just fits better on a losing team at this point. I think that's, you know, you're not, based on what you've seen in the last three months, AAA, majors, it doesn't scream uh, bat on a contending team. So you wonder if that opens things up because I do agree, 28 roster spots, that's only adding two. I would guess for the Jays, that means one catcher and one pitcher, all things being equal at this point. Totally. Um, so it's a good deal. Don't want to like oversell it. Like it's not going to, you know, change things dramatically. Like, you, you know, if you add say a win from this trade, right? So like 0.5 war from each of Simber and Dickerson, that's probably the best possible outcome. Yeah. Like, that's a great outcome yeah. from this deal. I mean, Did I guess, see it I being guess like any better than that. Best, best case scenario is uh, in the playoffs. It's division series game two. You know, Matt's is in trouble. Sure. Simber comes on, gets you out of a jam. Like it's a, it's geared yeah. also toward a matchup in the playoffs. But you got to get there yep. first. And the Blue Jays, like that is the more pressing yes. concern right there. It's good. And these guys are here to help them get there. So over the like remainder of the season, I mean, yeah, if you get a win out of this deal, like that's great. Um, and it's so it's super low risk, super low reward. Like it's kind of like the deal that this front office like makes all the time, like these sort of little marginal upgrades um, in areas of need where the cost is is relatively minimal these sort of like incremental increases that like they aren't going to get you written up on fan graphs as being like what are they doing uh by you know some dorks like us but it's also never going to be the type of deal that makes a huge impact either like you're, the blue jays aren't really taking like big swings with any of the trades that we've seen like think about last trade deadline right like what you know who who was shipped out at last deadline like Travis Bergen who ended up coming back you know Kendall Williams and Ryan Noda became Ross Stripling uh Griffin Conine was shipped out like there's nobody you're really like upset about losing right but then you know your return on that yeah it looks pretty fine I mean Robbie Ray had to be re-signed um but you know that's that's worked out extremely well Ross Stripling has has been you know pretty solid lately over the last few weeks but like there is going to have to be a time and it obviously isn't right now. And, you know, clearly the front office isn't ready to take this type of swing right now, but there probably is going to have to be a time where you're going to have to deal like legit top 10 prospects for somebody who's going to make a big impact. Some young controllable, you know, three, four, five win player, like some sort of higher risk for higher reward move. Because to this point, when you look at the trades, this front office has made, they all look pretty similar to the the one that they made yesterday. Right. And there could be, there will be shifts coming, coming up. And part of it depends on what's out there too, right? Like, you know, as you look at the market now, I think if there was a controllable young starting pitcher who was performing at the height of his powers and who was available, you know, like uh, Blake Snell in previous years, or, you know, you could, you could yeah. pick your, your option. Um, I think they'd be in on that guy. I, I don't see it right now when I look at the potential trade candidates and people in the industry view this starting pitcher trade market as being pretty weak right now. So, yeah. you know, Kyle Gibson, you just shouldn't have to give up a top prospect for him. So I don't think that that would really get to that point. Um, Max Scherzer, I don't think is going anywhere. Um, you know, Chris Bryant, he's a rental. You're not trading a top prospect for a rental. So I don't see the fit this year just with what is out there philosophically i actually think the jays would be open to it i i think that you know if there was that controllable young pitcher that controllable young third baseman um who's who's available like let's say bryant had another year and a half of control or two and a half years of control maybe you look at that um but i as it stands now if that guy's out there i haven't spotted him and so i yeah. certainly would agree with your assumption that this probably isn't the deadline we see blockbuster trades from the Jays. But hey, you can still do a lot of damage and they have needs still. So they should be continuing to look. Uh, and you can do a lot of damage with some of these more incremental upgrades. Yeah, they should still be looking to add, I mean, at least another reliever, yeah. maybe even two. Um, I'm sure they're going to look to add a starter. But as you mentioned, it's a pretty shallow market right now. We'll see if that changes towards uh, July 30th if any more sellers kind of emerge 
And uh, man, a left-handed hitting infielder would still be something that I think the the club can get, even though like they, they are kind of saying with dealing Joe Panic, like we feel good about Espinal, and obviously they like the internal options. You look at Otto Lopez and Kevin Smith, who's been playing a little third base and continues to like show a bunch of pop at at AAA. Um, Kevin Biggio obviously is going to play there, you know, a whole bunch. But I mean, if there's a, a way to get an Eduardo Escobar or uh, an Adam Frazier, I mean, great. Like let's do that. It's going to be difficult because those are going to be, um, you know, you're going to have to give up quite something for, for, for rentals there. But like that is still a need on this club. I would say even with this deal is a left-handed hitting infielder who, who you can expect just a, a steadier rate of production from uh, than the, uh, the options they have right now. Yeah, I, I could see that for sure. So I totally agree. Relief is a must. They must add another reliever at least. I mean, that's, that's baseline. They have to do that. Um, starting pitcher would be more nice to have and infielder I think would be more nice to have and depending on the fit depending on the player there there could be some some good uh, upgrades there you mentioned a couple of them column or Ann as well could be interesting there you know it's interesting because if you do then you're looking at a bench once Dickerson returns and the timelines that I've heard for Dickerson are different some people say he's doing great could be back within you know maybe a few weeks is more so the timeline other people look ahead beyond July 30th trade deadline and say it's more of a wild card. So we'll see on that front. But you could be looking at a bench of Dickerson slash Guriel, depending on whether it's a lefty or righty. So that's your outfielder. Then Biggio with the new third baseman playing third. And then your right. your catcher on a given day might be Kirk on the bench. I mean, so you could have Kirk, Biggio, and say Guriel. Kirk, Biggio, Dickerson. That's a good bench. Like that's what we're talking about yep. or what we were talking about a couple of weeks ago when we were talking about making a strength better and improving an offense that already was good, already was going to be scoring runs. So not necessarily the top need. I still think bullpen is the top need, but interesting to kind of look at those different configurations. Totally. If you could bump this show back to just kind of a utility role, like not as much every day, uh, you know, playing time as we've seen to this, to this point, I think phew, that's a huge benefit for this club. And even if you could look at like those 28 man rosters in September, or even like a playoff roster where you, you're probably not carrying a fifth starter. Yeah. Uh, so that kind of opens up another bench spot in either scenario, Santiago Espinal yeah. in there. If you want a defense first guy with a bit of speed in there, Kevin Smith or Otto Lopez, yeah. if you want somebody who's going to bring you a bit more thump with, with the bat, maybe be a better kind of pinch hit option late in the game. Like that, the blue Jays just look so much deeper. Cause like right now, this position player group is essentially healthy outside of Dickerson and Jansen and Kirk, who are both uh, starting rehab assignments. We're going to talk about the catching situation in the second half. Outside of those guys, this is essentially your position player yeah. group. Like, this is it. They're here. They're all healthy and playing right now. And right now, the bench is one of McGuire or Adams, I guess is Adams at this point, uh, Santiago Espinal and Jonathan Davis. Yeah. Make it better. Yeah, exactly. You know? Like, improve that. Dickerson getting healthy will improve that, but somebody else is probably going to get hurt too, man. Yeah. Like it's baseball, you know, somebody's probably going to be injured. Remember last September uh, with like 10 games to go in the year. And it was like, Teoscar Hernandez and Rowdy Tellez are both hurt all of a sudden, like just, just make the lineup deeper and make it deep. So I think that absolutely, you know, position player is still a, a target for this club going into the deadline along with the very obvious and still priority area of the bullpen. Right. And, you know, and I don't say that to try to relegate Biggio to the bench. He's been good. So I'm not trying to take that away from yeah. him. It's it's totally more so looking at it the way you do, where it's like someone is going to get hurt. You know, I'm not trying to just push Biggio aside. It's more so that you, you put him into that role where he's the super reserve. He's still going to play. He's still going to be, at worst, a pinch hit option, you know, who starts four times a week for you. So he's an important part of this team. Yeah, just become the Dodgers. Keep pushing it in that direction. That's how you get good. That's how you win World Series is you have lots of options every single day. You've got like your top, you know, three to four guys who are in every single one of your lineups, right? This is Vlad and Bo and Springer and Teoscar. But then you've got kind of like your bottom sort of, you know, four to five dudes who kind of you rotate through depending on matchups and depending on rest and health and depending on what makes sense. So if you can just, you know, deepen that sort of bottom half, you can, you know, give yourself a much better opportunity to win on any given night. Uh, let's step away. But when we come back, we are going to talk catchers and we are going to talk bullpen and so much more when we continue on At The Letters. It continues on At The Letters. Arden Zwelling, Ben Nicholson, Smith, our producers, Christian Ryan and Mike Tassoni. And it is time now for Keeping It Light, presented by Miller Light. 
Ben, uh, approaching the halfway point of the MLB season already. And uh, here's what I'm going to do for you. This is my gift to you here at the halfway point, the one-half gift. Congratulations for getting through it. I'm gifting you one AL MVP vote. No ballot, no ranking. You don't get to put in anybody in as a runner-up or as a number two. You get to pick only one player as the American League first half MVP who would you like to select? Well, there's there's only one choice. And this, this is crazy because as of a couple of weeks ago, it was so close. And I landed on the side of Vlad Guerrero Jr. Uh, until recently. But then Shohei Otani started hitting a home run or two every single night, <laughs> unless he's pitching, of course, in which case he probably goes six innings, strikes out eight or nine hitters, you know, holds, holds the opposition basically scoreless. It has to be Shohei Otani at this point. It's incredible unprecedented and, and historic what he's doing it's it's so fun to watch what he's doing every single night I just I don't think that I could make a compelling case that someone who leads the league in home runs has a thousand OPS has an ERA under three uh, as good as Vladdy has been and Vladdy has been incredible to me he's been the second best player in baseball but still I would have to go to Otani what about you so the argument for Vlad, I guess, is like, and it's, there's just layers to it, right? Because you got to say like, okay, so what offense has been down like quite a bit league-wide this season? Um, you don't really see high batting averages in baseball anymore. Like you don't see, you know, the contact ability that you once did. You see, you know, a ton of strikeouts and uh, we got the sticky stuff going on. So it's just harder to hit than ever and Vladimir Guerrero Jr. like just doesn't care about any of that stuff like none of it has bothered him at any point this season he has a 206 OPS plus so he is 106 percent better than league average um like he he has a 200 weighted runs created plus I mean like it's it's unbelievable right like what he's doing like in this era and just in the context of what MLB baseball is this season like that's the argument but I still side with you. Obviously, any ATL listener will know. Like, of course, I'm picking Shohei Otani. Like, how do you not pick Shohei Otani? He's like two players in one, you know? Like, and it's it's funny how normalized it's become and how desensitized people are to what Shohei Otani's doing, as if this isn't like the most remarkable thing we've seen in baseball in like a hundred years. <laughs> like, you know, like the fact that Babe Ruth just walks amongst us now and we're, it's just normal and we're all just cool with it. Like, and nobody really sa like says that much. The fact that the biggest topic in MLB for the last two weeks has been sticky stuff and not, Oh my God, Shohei Otani and not yeah. like, Holy crap. Did you see what he did last night? Night, like, Oh, like it's not like the guy's hitting wall scrapers. Every one of his home runs is a freaking missile. It's like, it yeah. comes out of a cannon. It's unbelievable. He is like simultaneously Fernando Tatis jr. Offensively. And like Corbin Burns as a pitcher. Like he is like, dude, he's both those guys in one. So, yeah, nobody could possibly be more valuable to a team because he is, like, technically two players in the body of one. So, of course, he's the MVP. And uh, I just wish that was the topic that MLB is, is being talked about across, uh, you know, the greater sports landscape rather than, you know, who's, uh, you know, using too much pine tar or whatever. Yeah, policing every last application of every substance within every bullpen on every last camera. I mean, it's it gets a little much, but, yeah. To return to the more important topic, Otani is incredible. He's just, he's one of a kind. Like you said, he's hes Babe Ruth. There's no other comparison. I mean, you could think about Bo Jackson and Deion Sanders, and uh, those guys are incredible, incredible athletes. And it's still, to me, astounding that they did what they did. I think this is comparable in a way, and I hope that people get the chance to tune into some Angels games and watch. It's, it's amazing. Like, he's such a watchable player, too. Even when he's not hitting home runs, the joy that he brings to the game is incredible. Even when he's, you know, he was against this, like this amazing Yankees reliever who had some incredible timing moves. I don't know if you've seen the clip, Arden, but look it up for anyone who hasn't. And this, this reliever wearing number 65 with a great mustache is out there doing like the Stroman, like little leg kick. I'm stopping right. the leg kick. Now I'm doing it. And Shohei is just cracking up in the batter's box, like as he's hitting against this guy with two strikes. And I just appreciated that. Or even when he gets his his belt checked for the substances, like he's not raging at the umpires the way some guys do. He's basically just like laughing along with them. So it's it's an incredible experience to watch Shohei Otani. He seems to be 
just like such a compelling uh, human being along with, and we don't know this stuff, this caveat, we don't know, um, but certainly comes off as an extremely, extremely likable person. Um, and so it's fun to watch him do his thing. And it's interesting, like with the Vlad Jr. comparison, because they do think Vladdy is the second candidate here. But Vladdy does, they both hit, obviously. And yeah. of the three other things that a baseball player can do, they both are decent base runners, but Otani gets the edge because he has 11 stolen bases to go along with all this. And of course he pitches. And Vladdy's actually giving the Jays some good defense. So you have, and, and Otani doesn't play barely any defense. So you have different elements contributing to the, the war that you look at. In this case, you probably have to look beyond war, see the bigger picture of what's happening. And what Otani's doing is just incredible. I mean, I'm giving Otani the massive, massive uh, uh, favor in speed, like are you, in yeah. terms of what he does on the base paths. I mean, yes. Otani's like a top 30 base runner, like in, ter- like in terms of sprint speed, like one of the fastest players in the game. Vladimir Guerrero Jr. has like nearly made himself average, which is like, whoa, wow. You know, like we're all yeah. so impressed with the, um, you know, with the, the increases that he's made, with the gains that he's made. And yeah, credit to him. But like Shohei Otani is like, one of the fastest players in the game yeah. on top of doing all the other stuff. Are you yeah. kidding me? Uh, and also, like, by the way, um, it, like, Vlad will have a number of years to win MVP awards. Like, I, I'm pretty sure Vlad's going to be really good in doing what he's doing this year, like, for a lot of seasons to come. There's some pretty serious, like, sustainability questions when it comes to Shohei Otani. Like, how many seasons, like the one he's having right now, is he going to be able to have just, like, physically? Like, how can he hold up, like, doing this? Like, I, I hope forever, right? Like, I hope he's the freak of all freaks. But, like, obviously, like, we all kind of know the limitations of the human body. And we all kind of know that it's probably a bill that's going to come due at some point for everything that he, you know, all the stress that he puts his body under. Like I said, not a, you know, wall scraper, home run, slap singles hitter. Like, a guy who, like, hits the ball really hard. Not a soft tosser, not a guy who's like carving up the strike zone, like a guy who throws hard as hell. So the amount of torque, the amount of force and tension going through his body, like it's, he's going to pay a price for this, right? So how many seasons like this can Shoei Otani have? I don't know. He's having one right now. Let's reward it with an MVP. Let's appreciate it because it's happening. Because I think the Vladimir Guerrero Jr. can continue doing what he's doing well into his mid to late 20s. Whereas for, for Shohei, we may be watching the, the prime or the peak right now this season. It's hard to imagine that he could do more, you know, when it comes to the overall combination of skills that he's presenting us with right now. And I think you just got to evaluate the season in front of you, right? Whether Vlad can do this 10 more times or whether this is also his career year, which it might be, and that's fine. It's an amazing career year. But of the two, at this point, it's Shohei. And we'll see where it leads, right? It's still three months to go. It's actually, I don't know, I don't always find myself watching the MVP races super closely. I mean, some in the past I've voted on them, and so, of course, that changes the way I look at it. But in some cases, you know, the race just isn't as compelling. And this year, the race is incredible, and I'm watching it very closely. Yes, nothing but continued uh, health and, and good luck to, to those guys over the second half. Uh, speaking of luck, let's talk about Reese McGuire. And let's talk about the Blue Jays catching situation. We're back, Ben. Remember all spring we talked about Reese McGuire, and then he was DFA and passed through waivers. We said, never again. We're never doing this again. Yep. And now we're back. We are <laughs> back we to are. the Reese McGuire discussion. The Reese McGuire discourse is enduring, and uh, it will outlive all of us. Uh, all right. So, they, like, here's just some, like, just some stats, all right? Like, just some numbers I'm going to throw at you here, Ben. All right. Reese McGuire has 28 hits this season in 33 games. It's 96 plate appearances in those 33 games, 28 hits. Danny Jansen and Alejandro Kirk have 26 hits in 59 games combined, 168 plate appearances. So Reese McGuire has produced two more hits in half the opportunity that those two guys have had combined you cannot deny the fact the guy has gotten hits <laughs> the guy's batting average is higher than the other two guys and the guy has like got the ball has come off of his bat and hit dirt or grass without being fielded cleanly and he has arrived at first base and been rewarded for it now some other stats for Risa wire okay batting average on balls and play 391 the eighth highest across mlb among wow. players to make at least 90 plate appearances. Again, eighth 
highest in batting average on balls in play. Unsustainable, clearly. Average exit velocity, how hard he hits the ball, Reese McGuire, 87 miles per hour on average, the ball coming off of his bat. That is in the bottom 20% of MLB hitters. Uh, And like we could do this all day. The difference between his expected batting average and his actual batting average is a difference of 55 points, the seventh highest positive differential in MLB. I mean, there are so many process indicators screaming that this guy has been lucky. He is a regression candidate. He can't sustain this. He can't keep it going. But like, if you're the Blue Jays, what do you do here with Alejandro Kirk and Danny Jansen coming back? Two guys who have not had the results actual cold hard results the reese mcguire has you have to decide what's more important running a meritocracy and rewarding the results of a guy who's getting hits in a game in which the whole point is to get hits or making a decision based on the process which suggests this guy won't continue to get hits and kind of trying to get out ahead of future outcomes that may or may not even materialize. Yeah, it's super interesting. I think you laid out the numbers very well there. It's very clear, you know, as you say from the beginning, yes, is is Reese McGuire getting hits? He is. That is undeniable. He is mm-hmm. getting hits, and that's that's great. You know, the Jays have benefited from that. At the same time, when you look ahead, no, not sustainable. So how do you approach this? I mean, certainly, if I was the Blue Jays, I wouldn't be in a rush to to go to Reese McGuire's locker and point this out to him because just let him ride it out and enjoy this. Um, you know, and first things first, as long as as long as the tandem is Reese McGuire and Riley Adams, well, Reese is going to play more easy. than Riley Adams, so that's fine, easy. right? That part's easy. Then, in addition to that, I saw you got a three zero green light the other day. Not doing that. (laughs) Not doing that. That's like going to the casino and you start winning. You know, your your winnings are piling up and you just decide to throw it all on red. Just like, no, that you've you've won. This isn't the time to be reckless. So he's earned it. He's earned it. No, he is. He hasn't. (laughs) He has not earned it. Um, So that's my personal opinion. So I would not give him three O green lights. I would play him over Riley Adams. Then. All right. Let's say in a week's time one of or both even of Jansen and Kirk are ready if they're both ready you're not demoting Reese McGuire at this point like you're not taking him off the big league roster so I guess that means you option either Jansen or Kirk okay that's fine Um, personally I'd be really intrigued to see what Kirk can do um, offensively and because of the nature of the position you've talked about this many times the demands the stresses Mm -hmm. the, the fatigue that goes into catching because of all of that I don't think that you have to go all or nothing. You can still play Reese McGuire somewhere between 40 to 60% of the time, depending on matchups. Is it a lefty? Is it a righty? Day game, night game? Have Kirk, let's say for argument's sake, Kirk is is ready first. Have him play the other 50%, give or take, and then it sorts himself out because it won't sustain itself. It just won't. So, you know, at that point, once mcguire has gone one for 12 or three for 20 and you're starting Kirk 60 and him 40, that's fine. Like I, that's how I would approach it. Does that answer it? Am I dodging it? I think that's no. That pretty much I think I that to. does answer it. Yeah. But I, I'm very interested to hear more about your answer when it pertains to Danny Jansen because Danny right. Jansen's working his way back as well. Like it looks yep. like Jansen and Kirk are kind of on the same track to be ready at uh, right about the same time. Danny yep. Jansen played in that uh, AAA game on Tuesday night, went over two with a couple walks, the most Danny Jansen line you're ever going to see. Mm-hmm. You are saying to Danny Jansen in this scenario where everybody's healthy, Adams, Kirk, McGuire, Jansen, everybody's healthy, ready to activate Jansen, Kirk. You are telling Danny Jansen, I am optioning you to AAA and you're going to play a AAA for the foreseeable future and I'm going ahead with Kirk and McGuire at the big league level. Well, you know, of course, you want to see what Kirk looks like, right? You want to see how he does on his rehab. If Kirk, Kirk has hit everywhere, right? He's he's the guy who hits. So if he hits on his rehab, let's say he's, you know, not that you want to tie it to OPS because it's such a small sample, but let's say he's making really good contact on his rehab and having really good at bats. Yeah, I I would rather see that guy. And I don't know, man. Like, do you see it differently? Like, it, this isn't the time. Like, egos have to be out the window, right? They're in the second half of the season at this point. It's a close race. They got to do what's gonna what's going to allow them to win. You're not just going to discard and DFA Reese McGuire for the purposes of organizational depth, like you said, for the purposes of 
how it plays in that room. Um, you know, it's it's not like he's like he's he's competent. It's not like I just I don't think this is sustainable, but he's still okay. Yeah. Um, so you're not just going to jettison him. So it's one or the other. It's Kirk or Jansen. I, I would lean Kirk. I think that gives the Blue Jays the better chance to win. Egos aside, like, do you see it differently? It's tough because you piss somebody off in every scenario, right? Yeah. Like, there's no, there's no clean answer to it, right? Because, like, yeah, you DFA Reese McGuire. Yeah, you don't only, like, you know, just kind of show the rest of the room, like, it's not a meritocracy, right? The fact yeah. that this guy is hit as much as he has and doesn't get rewarded for it ends up being off the roster for it. Um, and by the way, like, if the Blue Jays DFA Reese McGuire and lost him on waivers, it wouldn't be the worst outcome. Um, no. Like, I don't, he's kind of in, like, a weird spot where I don't, think he has a ton of trade value right no. uh but he might be in a place now where he would get claimed right on waivers yeah. but right? but you're so, not worried about you know the curse of reese mcguire and you know what is, is this going to haunt yeah. the franchise right it's okay yeah I, I don't know if you're going to have like a geo or shella situation with reese not mcguire even that. if you do like credit to him man and like credit to the club that <laughs> turns him into absolutely the geo or shella behind the yeah. plate for the Pittsburgh Pirates, yeah, or whoever it's going to be, but like, yeah, we then, saw. Look, you know, San Francisco like, got got taken on, got claim on waivers. So I feel like Reese McGuire might get claimed too. Go ahead, and he and he could. You know, it's a different yeah. situation now, mid season, maybe more demand. He's he's playing better, so he could get claimed. But you know, even if he's even if he becomes you know the Gio Urshela level, Urshela is good. You know, he's a yeah. good defender. He's probably got a seven fifty OPS. You know, with the Yankees right now, that's good. Those are good players, but you know. It's it's okay. It's it's okay to let some guys go. You need to have space on the end of your roster too. You know, you have to be able to churn. You can't lock in forty guys. You have to have some sort of flexibility. Yes. So the the downside would be just kind of sending a message to your clubhouse of like, you know, it's not it's not so much about results, right? And like we're gonna try to kind of get ahead yes. of outcomes that may or may not yeah. happen, right? Reese McGuire could keep it up, right? For for all the BABIP and eggs of Elo and all the expected stats, like I don't know, some sometimes guys outplay their expected stats. It's unlikely, right? But it's a hard sell in the room where they don't care about your spreadsheets, man. Like they don't care what it says on your, you know, what the quality of contact says should have happened. It's like, did the guy get hits or not? Yeah. Um, so there's that you demote Danny Jansen. All right. Well, what's that going to do for Danny Jansen? Who like, when was the last time he was like a minor leaguer? 18, nine, was he a minor yeah. leaguer? 19, you know, like he has 18, been right? kind of, your guy for a number of years and you've committed to him as a starting catcher. So look, you, you can obviously like take a look at the offensive results um, over the last couple of years and say like, you know, you had opportunities and it didn't go well and maybe you need to go down to the minors and like, you can come back. Look, Teoscar Hernandez was demoted. He came back. Lourdes Gurriel Jr. was demoted. He came back. Like those guys took it in stride and got better. Maybe Danny Jansen can do the same thing. But you also like you have to be careful in how you manage this with Danny Jansen, the guy who came into the year as your starting catcher. And there's Alejandro Kirk, who's like still 21, 22, right? Like would be the guy based on like you know what like uh, hierarchy, I guess, in terms of tenure and status and things like that. All the guy does is hit, right? And then you also have to think about, uh, you know, defensively. Like, are you cool with Alejandro Kirk yeah. defensively being your catcher, you know, four or five days a week? Like, I don't think you have any questions about Reese McGuire defensively. I think Dave Jansen is sound. With Kirk, there still are outstanding questions defensively. Um, and just being as young as he is and game calling at the big league level and having as little experience as he does, how much of a hit does your pitching staff take then, right? Like, how much does it impact other areas of the roster if Alejandro Kirk is catching every day and not giving you the same level of kind of experienced game calling and game management that uh, a Jansen or a McGuire would be as experienced as they are still being young guys as well. So that's what I'm saying is it's a really tricky situation if Reese McGuire keeps hitting and all these guys are healthy at the same time. Yeah, no doubt. And I think on the on the point about Kirk, you know, the Jays tipped their hand last year when they were trying to make the playoffs, qualify for the playoffs, and they did show confidence in Kirk. So in similar circumstances this year, a lot of, you know, a lot of leverage, a lot of significance to every game. I could still see them going to Kirk. I don't think that's a bad option by any stretch. And as for the messaging, if, and this is hypothetical still, because if, hey, if Jansen goes out and he hits four homers on his rehab, you promote him. That's easy. Yeah. You know, he can make this decision for himself still. So I'm not ruling this out. But, you know, if in the scenario that Kirk is the guy who outperforms Jansen and he's the one who is just 
hitting better, swinging better at a certain point when they're ready to be activated, what you say to Jansen is, look, a lot of guys, whether it's like you mentioned, hey, Oscar, Lourdes, Nate Pearson went down to the minors for a tune-up. It happens all the time. Danny, we just need you to work on your swing. We know you're going to be up and help the big league team soon. Can't wait to see you up there. Talk soon. Like, I don't think it has to be more than that. Or, and this is <laughs> okay. the, uh, or, this is the, uh, like, the little purple devil emoji option. Do you trade Alejandro Kirk? You could. Do you, do you trade Alejandro Kirk to the Pittsburgh Pirates for Adam Frazier? Uh, who has another year of control after this, but Alejandro Kirk, like just starting his major league career and look what he's, what he's shown. And uh, Ben Sherrington, like Steve Sanders, you guys know what this guy can do. You saw it up close, you know, the bat plays and it's real. Just give us that Frazier who we can install at third base every day, trade Kirk. And we're just going to punt offensively uh, a, a catcher, which is fine because we just add Adam Frazier to our friggin' lineup. Our lineup's like so ridiculously deep right now that we can punt on the nine hole and just have, have capable defensive hands behind the plate so that our pitchers can keep being good and we'll rely on one through eight to like you know generate the runs and score the runs and and we'll let Danny Jansen and then Reese McGuire prevent the runs maybe you do that maybe that makes sense Ben it's interesting I, I think it's really interesting like I think if I'm the Pirates I do that deal for sure and if I'm the Jays I don't think I do but I, I don't yeah. think like look within the Blue Jays front office I wouldn't be surprised if there are people who would make that deal. You know, I, I don't, I'm not saying that is like, Hey, this, there's like a right or wrong answer to it. I think, um, I think it's really interesting. It's probably because this time of year you get some, some trade ideas, some of which I'm sure come from me. that are just kind of out there and they don't make a whole <laughs> lot of sense, but I think this one actually kind of makes sense. I, I mean, I don't know where you land on it. Like if you're the Jays, would you do Adam Frazier for Alejandro Kerr? I try to I try to get Chris Stratton too is what I would try to do. Sure. I don't know if how the Pirates feel about that. Like I don't think you're getting Rodriguez and uh, and Frazier for for Kirk, but I try to get Chris Stratton too. Because like look, okay. you know, Chris Stratton's not the biggest part of your rebuild. You know, you're probably going to end up you know non-tendering or DFAing him anyway. Pittsburgh, like you saw that like Adam Simber doesn't get a whole lot on the market with like three you know plus years of of control and like yes, I think Stratton's probably. He certainly throws harder and misses more bats. I mean, you know, you can use Stratton in more spots. So, yeah, is he better than Simber? Like, yeah, probably. But, you know, it's not a huge difference. And you just saw what the price, you know, is going to be. Stratton and Frazier for Kirk, I'm doing that. Interesting. Really interesting. Would you? I th no, I think I still think I would hold on to Kirk. I would try to get a reliever for different prospects and try to get a reliever. I haven't, and to be fair, I haven't dived deep on Stratton, what he brings do you view him as like kind of a setup guy or what's his, what's he's his profile? A, what's, what's good about him and why I think he's a good fit for the Blue Jays is he can do a few different things, right? Like mm -hmm. he can just throw an inning and that's great. Or you can give you two as well, right? Mm -hmm. Like, and I think that he could kind of replace David Phelps in a way, or even like Julie, what Julian Merriweather was last season. And obviously doesn't have the same stuff as Merriweather, but like a guy who can like face six, seven, eight, nine hitters, like if you needed him to, or a guy who can just come in and, and pitch a pitch one inning for you. So I, I think that just the, the many ways that you can use them is what makes him appealing as well as like really strong results this year and, and has been useful. Interesting. Yeah, for anyone who's not aware, just looked him up. 30 years old, 259 ERA this year, 41 and two rates thirds. Too, buddy. Oh, nice spin rates. Check the spin talking? rates. Okay, good. Yeah. Strikeout rates pretty low. See, so for me, if I'm giving up Kirk, I'd want to get someone who's striking out like a lot more hitters, like 12 per nine. Um, no, but you're also getting Frazier. Totally, totally. Um, I, I, I think the Jays need someone who can strike out like 12 per nine, but. You know what? Do they all would they also be better with Chris Stratton? Yes. And like to the point of incremental upgrades and improving where you can and you know, it just just nudging it ahead. Totally agree with that. Um and again, on paper it might be fair. To me, viewing it from the Jays standpoint, I don't know if that nudges it over the finish line for me, but if I'm the Pirates, I absolutely want Kirk. So the Blue Jays bullpen is um improving somewhat on its own interestingly uh, yep. is the final topic we're going to talk about here. And that's, you know, Jordan Amano has been, you know, solid 
through and through. But uh, yeah, like Tim Mays has looked like pretty good lately after you know some uh, uh, some some down appearances. Um, you know, I don't know three four weeks ago now. Essentially, um, you know, you got Jacob Barnes in there who, you know, we're going to see what, what he can be. Uh, Patrick Murphy's been, uh, you know, fine. Um, Tyler Chatwood is just like a complete roll of the dice, it seems, every time that he goes out. But like sometimes the dice roll comes up snake eyes and it's like yep my stuff is working today and i'm getting tons of swing and miss and i'm dominant all of a sudden uh do you think that the blue jays bullpen is playing closer to its like true talent level like do you think that this is more what you can expect from this group or are the blue jays just playing like the orioles and the marlins probably some of both i think they're clearly better than how they performed over the course of the first few weeks of June, there's or last week of May, whatever stretch was, you know, the horrible stretch where we were talking about it every single week. It was like they six were never, weeks, dude. Yeah. yeah, six weeks, yeah. I mean, even then, as it felt like they were blowing every possible lead, like they were never that bad. Like they were, it, it was like the worst outcome within that range that they, you know, that um, ended up happening. So we're seeing some sort of normalizing there. I, I don't think they're quite this good. Um, because really there is a lack of truly trustworthy arms in in the bullpen jordan romano is having a great season one that you know could seriously earn him some all-star consideration and, and be deserving um i think that tim Mesa, like you said has really stepped up that's huge for this team from the left side beyond that there's still that search chatwood anthony castro um murphy's been good you know we'll see what simber can do but it's hard to really know. And so it, it's, yeah, I, I, I still think this is a below average bullpen um, in the context of Major League Baseball. I, I think, you know, that's probably pretty fair to say when you look at the injuries that they've, they've had. Um, so, yeah, they're, they're not this good. Considering the Chatwood and like, yeah, once um, Delise and Baraki and Merriweather are back, if they're back, like it's a lot easier to kind of manage how you use Tyler Chatwood. Um, yeah. But right now, I mean, he is kind of, you know, one of your top three options, honestly, with, you know, mm -hmm. after, <laughs> with, uh, with Jordan Romano and uh, I don't know, you want to throw Castro in there. I guess, I guess, I guess throw Simber in there now yep. too, as well. But like Tyler Chatwood kind of has to face leverage right now with just how this bullpen is constructed. Um, how do you manage that then? Because like, it's, you just don't know until he's on the mound, like whether he's in the zone or not. And if he's in the zone again, swing and miss, it's great. But then like when he's not in the zone, he's like really not in the zone. So do you have to like almost always have somebody warming up behind him? Is it suck to do that to a guy? And is that kind of kibosh his confidence? Does he deserve that benefit of the doubt at, at this point, considering what's happening? Like, you know, just the, the oscillating, uh, you know, performance that you see, and how do you kind of manage this if you're Charlie Montoya? Yeah, it's interesting. You know, as for the second part there, like the way he struggled to throw strikes, like having someone warming up behind him, yeah, you got to do that. If like you don't worry about his confidence, like sorry, this is this is Major yeah. League Baseball. You need to have contingencies. You need to have backup plans. You know, I hope that. Bo Bichette's confidence won't be shattered if the Blue Jays draft a shortstop in a couple of weeks, right? Like, you just got to right. do your thing. You've got to not worry about the guys behind you. Focus on what's in front of you. That's it. And, you know, if someone else views it differently, then, you know, that's their, you know, burden to bear in a sense is, is how I would view that part of it. But I, I think that when it comes to how you handle and what spots you use for Tyler Chatwood, I would bump him a little bit. Um into kind of alongside Murphy and Castro not to and again like you said you can't totally avoid him in leverage because there just aren't enough trusted leverage guys and there are a lot of leverage spots in the course of an average game I mean it's yeah. it's you know sometimes from the sixth inning on where you're you're pitching in leverage so that means a lot of guys get leverage and Chatwood will will be one of them um, I, I think I would put him near Murphy and, and Castro but what about you how would you handle this I mean, right now, like you got, you just have to throw them because of the yeah. way the bullpen's constructed. You're just waiting to get Raphael Delis back, who I think is probably the closest of the three, and then uh, Baraki probably second most close to the Merriweather behind him. So once you got like Delis and Baraki back, it's a lot easier to kind of manage it. But yeah, I think right now, yeah, I kind of lean on Tyler Chatwood, and uh, look, he's been 
good more often than he's been bad, right? So, like, it, you can, there is reason for confidence in him. It's just the bad is really bad, right? And the is. bad is, like, really outside the zone and really walking everybody and really I can't throw a strike for the life of me right now you know if you could just like if it was just sort of bad right? it was just like yeah I just put you know two three runners on but put pitch out of it type of deal that'd be a lot easier to manage but the thing is just you know things spiral so yeah I think you kind of think you put them you put them on the mound and you give them that first hitter and you kind of see how it looks and depending how it looks maybe somebody's getting up right away yep <laughs> right uh at what if it looks good, maybe somebody isn't. But again, we're still talking about like a bullpen with like Jacob Barnes and Taylor Sacedo and uh, Patrick Murphy. And like, it's not exactly, you know, Joel Pyamps. Not exactly he's ahead proven of a lot options, of those guys. Yeah. Right? Not exactly proven options out there. So yeah, he still is definitely pretty high up the depth chart. But uh, yeah, we'll see, man. You know, Simber slots into uh, an important role. See what else the Blue Jays can do as they head towards the deadline and, and who else they can acquire uh we're going to wrap it up but my name's arden swelling and that is ben nicholson smith and our producers are christian ryan and mike tassoni you can email us at the letters at sportsnet.ca i want to thank you for listening as always talk to you next time on at the letters